to Journey Through the Gate, your paranormal portal podcast, as we delve into the many questions and wonders brought on by the supernatural experience. What's on the other side of the gate? Let's find out together. Hey listeners, how you doing? Guess who I have coming through the gate again? One of our, it must be our favorite guest. All the listeners, I'm getting back on, get them back on. Well, due to circumstances beyond our control, uh, he had a little time on our hands and I'm going to get him in here and he can tell you about it. That's right. I've got one of Britain's absolute best historians and ghost storytellers, Simon and Whistle. Come on in here, Simon. It's great to be back again, Cisco. Thank you very much for having me on the show again. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Doors always open. The gates always open to you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> We're all going through this and we all had a little time on our hands and a lot of podcasters got together and everybody's doing, they're doing what they can do from home. They're either, uh, you know, making new videos or, or playing music. It's wonderful that people are doing things like the live streams and things and everybody's just doing what they do, you know, they're trying to give. Yes. It's really good to have the internet, isn't it? I think isn't it's it? uh, a fantastic way of communicating with people, really. It is. It, it absolutely is. And I love how, I love all the videos I'm seeing where people are leaning out their windows and singing together in the, you know, uh, across the, the, the road to the other, um, uh, you know, to their neighbors in different countries. And uh, how is it for you out there in uh, in the UK right now? What are you seeing? Well, um, I live up in the north of England. We have had very, very few um, contractions of the COVID virus. Um, the city of London seems to be the place where it's um, the epicenter. Mm -hmm. I know that in London, they're expecting a huge wave of um, infected people. But um, in the north, uh, we're all on... Um, lockdown right. you can go to the supermarkets but all the public houses are being closed uh all the theaters all the restaurants are being closed so it's very much a case of going to the supermarket then coming straight home again mm -hmm. and uh what what we've been doing is just sending one member of the family to the supermarket so we all don't go together really yeah and that's all you really can do is just, you know, do what they're asking you to do. I spoke to a gentleman that you and I both know, a Mr. David Cook. Uh, oh, yes. 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 Friend of ours, a mutual friend. And uh, he pretty much told me the same thing. I think he's uh, he's a, a little, uh, as he said he's about three hours from you. And uh, he's feeling the same thing. You know, all you can do is stay inside and, you know, try to take, take it seriously. And... Um, you know, be careful. You know, um, yeah, I think it. Would, um, I think it would definitely work, really, uh, Cisco. Because um, if we're not contacting each other, then the virus can't spread. Right. And I think that's what the governments are really going for, isn't it? I to try so. and stop the spread. I think so. And I think we know a little bit more about it now, um, as far as you know, uh, getting different sources and you know, talking, uh, everybody talking together. Um, it just, I think it seemed to last an awful lot longer than a regular virus on hard surfaces. So really take heed and do the gloves, do the, it may seem silly, but it's not, you know, you, I don't think you can be too careful, you know? No, no, be true. Very true. Yeah. Don't um, be too careful. I must say this, though, uh, my heart goes out to the people in Italy. Yes. Um, the Italians seem to have really, really suffered, Bless but you. I only heard today that, um, 36, Italian doctors have actually died, and uh, that really is dedication to duty, isn't it? Yeah, they are our heroes. I mean, they always have been. I think we're really putting people up that we took for granted in a lot of ways. Our yeah. healthcare workers, our EMTs, even our truck drivers. I don't know how you're feeling there um, with just getting supplies and the people that are, you know, uh, the farmers and people that are getting food and things like that. It takes, it, it, I think it's a time to step back and really appreciate everything that we have, your family, everything that you wanted to spend time with before and couldn't because you were working or uh, you know, take those that time to do something positive with this if you can, you know, even if yes, it's, yes. even if it's spending more time with your, you know, the family you're locked in with and trying not to make each other crazy. 
<laughs> yeah, very, very true. Very yeah. true is that, Cisco, yeah. isn't it? I would like to think that once this um, horrible situation has gone, and let's hope it does go, mm -hmm. it'd be really nice if the world could perhaps come together and yes. uh, look at each other differently and, uh, and uh, you know, perhaps we could try and live together in peace, which would be quite nice, really. It would. I mean, if, if nothing else, if this does not... Um show each heart how very fragile we all are. I lost two co-workers uh, this week um, that I worked with. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just, you try to justify it in your head and go, okay, well, this, they had this or this was, one was young, you know. Um, it just, it, the thing is, is we're scared of an enemy we can't see. And the best thing that you can do for me in my household, what I've done is gone back to, I always try to go to the old ways, the old, what they call them, the old uh, the herbal things and boosting your immune, oh, yes. boosting your immune and, you know, everything, you know, if it's, if it's worked before, why not? You know, I think if I make another smoothie with... <laughs> For my family, they're going to kill me, you know, but high vitamin C, fresh fruit. I was amazed, Simon, when I went to the grocery store and the things I were seeing gone, of course, all the paper products and things like that, but it was all the convenience, yes. all the convenience items were gone, all the meat. And I'm looking over at the vitamin aisle and the fresh produce and I'm like, it's all still here. What, what are people doing? You know, that's what I was going for, the vitamins and the, the supplements and you know, the fresh fruit, the vitamin C and things like that. And, um, trying to get it from the fresh organic stuff. And I was shocked that it was still there. I thought, I would have thought everybody was going for that. You know, it was amazing. Yeah. You know, if it worked for our, you know, our, our grandparents, our grandparents before them, why not? You know, I mean, that's all we I can do. Completely, yes. Mm -hmm. Almost like a herbal remedy. Exactly. You know, just like I said, boosting your immune and trying to get outside if you can. If it's sunny, get some sun, get some vitamin D, get some, you know, and stay active and stay calm because stress causes a uh, breakdown in your immunity, you know, so don't be it's fearful. So Do what you can. Do what you can, you know. But uh, and getting together with good friends and doing what we do, like we're doing today, Simon, we found something positive to do. And I guarantee if I asked you, Oh, uh, what am I going to ask yes. Simon? If I asked him if he possibly might have a ghost story or two for us, do you think he might, listeners? <laughs> do you, Simon? I certainly have. I've got a whole variety. Um, oh, my goodness. I must say, um, um, this has got, a, shall I say, an American connection. Okay. Um, I um, have a, a tour which takes place um, at a lovely hotel in Lancashire. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. And uh, it's called the Duncan House. You, uh, listeners can actually look at it on the internet. But it was the home of a very, very wealthy family called the Duncan Houses. And um, way back in the, the 1700s, of course, um, wealthy families would employ their own staff that have their own staff that also have their own teachers. And the Duncan House family, they employed a very, very beautiful young lady called Lucette. Uh, she came from Paris. Uh, she was a governess, and she looked after the Duncan House children. Um, in the summer of uh, 1774, she arrived, and she settled in very well and looked after the children. Now, in 1775, in the winter period, um, they had a ball at the, at the home, a gorgeous ball, and as each person entered the ballroom, they were given a glass of red wine. As uh, the party started, a handsome British Army officer, a red coat officer, arrived. He was a lieutenant in the uh, Blues and Royals Household Cavalry, a very, very famous English infantry regiment. And um, as he walked inside the ballroom, he saw Lucette. It was love at first sight. As they glanced into each other's eyes, it was literally love at first sight. The lieutenant uh, met her on quite a few occasions and then proposed to her. And her employers were, of course, happy to let her go. But uh, as her husband was a serving officer, he was sent abroad and he was sent to Boston, Massachusetts mm. in 1776. Of course, at that period of time, America wanted total independence from 
the United Kingdom. The War of Independence, of course, claimed many lives on many sides of the of the conflict, and uh, the lieutenant disappeared. Uh, of course, in those days, uh, there were no telephones, uh, no laptops. The only way you could communicate <laughs> with people True. would be to actually send a letter. Now, soon after the lieutenant had left England, Lucette found to her delight she was carrying a child. Uh, word filtered back from America that her husband had been killed at Concord. Mm. And she was deeply, deeply upset by this and received the letter on Christmas Eve, 7, 1677. Uh, she made her way uh, down to the River Calder and she jumped into the cold water with child. No. And it happened. Her husband had not been killed. <gasps> He'd been captured and made a POW and was later released after the conflict, he came back to England two days after his wife had indeed taken her life. Oh. Now, it's only around the Christmas period at this beautiful building, the Duncan House, that their two ghosts have been seen in the ballroom and indeed the avenue trees that take them down to the River Calder. A very, very touching and a very, very sad story. But continuing with this theme, I conduct uh, guided tours at a very, very beautiful building called Salmsbury Hall. And again, listeners that they want to can go on the internet and see this beautiful 1536 building, which is still standing beautifully. Um, to this very day, weddings take place at Salmsbury Hall and they have a chapel there. And nearly every Saturday, a wedding takes place. By far the most famous wedding ever to take place at Sarsby Hall was of a young lad called John Creesap. John Creesap, again, like the lieutenant, was a serving British Army officer. His wedding in 1773 was very, very well received. He uh, married a beautiful young lady called uh, Gail Bradall. And being a serving army officer, he was sent overseas to Philadelphia, um, from Philadelphia uh, to uh, Boston and from Boston to New England. And his wife absolutely loved New England. And she said, John, why don't you resign your commission and become a civilian? Great idea. I'm sick of the army, said John. <laughs> so they started their own business and were doing very well. Their next door neighbours were doing extremely well. It seemed that America was the land of opportunity. However, one person recognised this more than anyone else, and that was good old King George back in England. And he thought, these people need taxing and taxing again. John said to his wife one day, I'm working my socks off and all I'm doing is paying tax to England. He got very annoyed. His neighbours got annoyed. He then met a gentleman called George Washington. And George Washington's parents came from the county of Lancashire in England. And George recognised John's northern English accent and had a conversation with him. Uh, John, uh, I believe you've served in the British Army. I would like to form a rebel army and throw the British administration out of North America. This country needs to be independent from England. Will you join me? I will join you, sir. And John Creaser became what's called a Pathfinder General in the, the rebel, what we, the, we call the rebel forces in England. Uh, he was at Lexington, Concord, Bunker Hill, Ticonderoga, and the final surrender at Yorktown in 1781. And uh, now the Brits had gone. John Creaser was summoned to see George Washington. Ah, John, I'd like to offer you a position in the new United States Armed Forces as a general. Will you take up this position? I will, sir. My mission for you, John, is now to encourage, to encourage the Native Americans to leave uh, New England, New Hampshire, New Jersey. Will you take up this position? Well, he did do. And I think it's fair to say that John Creesop had the blood of many an innocent score and many an innocent brave in his hands. But all good things come to an end. And he was captured by the Huron, North American Canadian Indians. And just like John Wayne in a famous Western movie, all his men were dispatched by the Indians. And he was tied to the totem pole and ordered to be given the death 
of a thousand cuts. Oh, really? Now, John Cresap was indeed a Yorkshireman. And Yorkshire folk are renowned for being very, very stubborn. In fact, Sir Ronald Fynde, that great British explorer, will take no one from Yorkshire on his expeditions because they like to whinge and complain about everything. <laughs> Cresap was no different. He was tied to the totem pole and ordered to be given the death of a thousand cuts. But he showed no emotion and was heard to say the words, you'll get nout from me. The Indians were so shocked by his bravery, he wasn't even scared about dying and they became scared of him. They released his bonds. He rushed back into the forests and got back to Washington's headquarters. Uh, sir, I've had enough of this, sir. I would like to return to my native Craven in West Yorkshire, back in England, sir. George Washington said there and then, John, my country is indebted to you. You will always be an American citizen. He got back to his native Yorkshire, a place called Craven, and died at the age of 74. He's buried at a place called New Pudsey Church, which is not too far from the city of Bradford in West Yorkshire. And his grave tablet very, very proudly says, General John Cresap, United States Armed Forces. And to this very day, the Pentagon are responsible for the grave. You could say that John Cresap was the all-American, all-Yorkshire hero. But very, very turbulent times and in many ways, very, very sad times for two countries which are now bound together by not only a common language, but by democracy, which, of course, both countries uh, love deeply. Mm. Isn't that amazing? It, Isn't that amazing yeah. that we've we've somehow now. I love that. I love having so many friends across the pond now because I love that we've all kind of come together, you know. And I think Very, this, too, going on right now is actually bringing us together as well. It's a common I think so. common thing we're all going through. This is That's amazing. And I've heard that story. And I'll tell you, as a Native American myself, Lenampi and uh, Cherokee, and death of a thousand cuts is nothing to, uh, <laughs> is nothing to uh, you know, shake a finger at. That was an absolutely horrible torture. And for him to have that bravery. Um, I've heard a lot, a lot of different stories about different Native American tribes um, actually taking somebody, uh, acquiring them into the tribe because they showed bravery. That was the number one thing uh, that would do it, you know, which is where the gauntlet comes from. You guys have a gauntlet there, but we also had one in the Native Americans. I'm sure you've seen it where they had to run down and everybody got oh, to hit yes. them. But that's part yes. of it. You know, you have to get up and go through it. And if you didn't go through it, you probably would die, you know. Yeah, I've often thought, you know, Cisco, those early settlers must have been very, very tough people. Mm. I mean, they must have been really, really tough people because mm -hmm. uh, to go to the new world, as, as we call it here in England, mm -hmm. uh, the pilgrims, the pilgrims, you know, mm -hmm. a new world, uh, very, very brave people, mm. very brave. And, you know, now that you mention that, Simon, something comes up to my mind, something we're going through right now. Uh, when they came over here, they didn't realize they were carrying that invisible enemy with them. They were bringing smallpox and the common cold and things like that, that Native Americans were just not built up their immunity to and took out quite a few, uh, you know, tribes of just wiped them out completely with their smallpox sure. and things like that. So even then, I mean, again, that shows how fragile we are. I mean, we know so much, we've got so much technology and here it is just this little little germ causing all this harangue right now you know it's amazing amazing it is it really is it amazing is, it is <laughs> it's something else but it's a beautiful story and i can't believe he got away and he went right back to where he started from i've had enough of this new new world <laughs> well i think um, you know yorkshire folk um yorkshire of course it's a very very famous county uh, mm -hmm. a state if you will in the north of england and uh, um Way back in the uh, Olympic Games, uh, had Yorkshire been an independent country, uh, I think they'd have come about ninth in the medal tables of the world, you know, the Olympic gold medals. They were uh, quite a, an, an amazing county, really, uh, very resourceful people, really. Mm. Just tough and, you know, not giving up. And that that is amazing. I mean, you know, you can't really say that out of uh, each country has their story of that kind of bravery and stick to because I think... 
if if we didn't, you know, it wouldn't be here anymore. You know, I mean, I yes. have that too with my last name being Murdoch. And I don't know if you've ever done your ancestry, but uh, I look back at that and I have a little bit of Scottish, mostly Native American, but I have a little bit of Scottish. That's where the name comes yes. from. Yes. And I was telling somebody the other day that, you know, there was only so many colonies in Scotland that, you know, so many uh, families that survived, you know, you had to be tough to get through the winters and the famines sure. and everything sure. else. So I think we all can look back on our ancestors and give them a hat tip because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> very, very true. Very true. <laughs> it's amazing. Wonderful. Now, I know you have other stories and you tell anyone you want. Uh, what is your just you have so many fascinating stories i know we've done the pendle witches which has just been a favorite among the listeners of course jack the ripper and your haunted yes. pub stories and all those that that you've come to tell but um you just tell me whatever ones you want because you know the stories and i just amazing the history and everything else is just the way you paint a story is gorgeous so the brush is yours my friend Thank you very much, Cisco. This is um, the sort of story which is really, I'm, I'm told, about 44 million to one against. It is a ghost story. It's a haunting story, but one that I absolutely cherish, Cisco. Mm -hmm. And we're going to turn the clock back now to 1960, when I was just five years old. Mm -hmm. um, my father um, bought a beautiful, beautiful Victorian house in a county called Cumbria, which is um, right at the very, very top of the northwest of England. And I remember climbing the removal vehicle, which was full of tea chests, full of clothes and cutlery, with my mum, dad, brother and sister. And we drove to this gorgeous location, um, Cumbria, uh, very near the Scottish border. And I remember leaving the vehicle and looking at this beautiful three-story house and the gardens surrounding it. And I thought, how fortunate and how lucky am I to actually live here? I uh, grew to love the house very much indeed, but I almost felt as if the house was actually talking to me. And it certainly talked to my mum and dad the very, very first night we arrived. It was um, December 1960. And um, because I was only five years old, my brother was uh, eight years old, my sister about two, mum and dad made our beds up very, very, very quickly. And we fell into a deep sleep, as young children do, of course. Mum and dad carried on until about one o'clock in the morning, unloading uh, tea chests, unloading crockery and cutlery. Because the house was a um, country house, there were no neighbours. And mum and dad thought, well, the last job we need to do is to put up any curtains. Mum and Dad made up their bed and they climbed in after the long journey. And my father turned over in bed and noticed that bright, bright moonlight was actually uh, emanating through the, through the window and illuminating the whole room. It was almost like, almost like daylight, if you will, a lovely silver moon. He then heard the sounds of very, very tiny footsteps. The door of the bedroom slowly opened and in came a liver and white cocker spaniel dog. Oh. The dog came into the bedroom, sat in the corner of the room, and my father heard its tail actually wagging against the, the carpet. His first thoughts were, oh no, I've left, I've left the door open. Downstairs this dog has got into the house somehow. He got out of bed and walked towards the dog that was sitting in the corner of the bedroom. The dog seemed to turn to look at the window, almost as if its name was being called. My father reached for the collar of the dog, and to his horror, his hand went straight through it. He swallowed deeply. Uh, his heart accelerated. He made a second attempt, and his hand went through the dog again. The dog then turned and completely vanished. At the same time, my mother was in a deep, deep sleep, and she woke up with a jolt to see my father sitting at the end of the bed. What's wrong, she said. My father said, well, I've just seen this dog. I've made two attempts to touch it, but my hand's gone through it. My mother said, I've just had a most unusual dream. It was crystal clear. I dreamt there was a man outside our house pointing up at our bedroom window 
with a dog lead in his hand. He was wearing Victorian clothing. They then put two and two together. My mum and dad never told me this story until I was about 15 years old. I spent 10 very, very happy years in that house. I grew to love it. Um, each room felt quite different, and it was almost as if the building wanted to talk to you. Uh, but it was not an evil feeling. It was a very warm feeling. When my father sold the house in 1971, it absolutely broke my heart. We moved um, from there to what we call a bungalow, a building about five times smaller <laughs> because my mother had had a heart attack and she couldn't climb the, the three-story stairs that uh, that house actually had. However, this is where the story takes a very, very sinister twist. Three years ago, my wife and I went on a Mediterranean cruise on a beautiful cruise ship um thoroughly enjoyed it we went to gibraltar went to malaga went to italy went to sardinia uh went to cairo it was absolutely fantastic um on this uh, ship there must have been about five thousand guests and you had what's called a black tie event where you would go down to the restaurants and you had to wear a black tie and um one of these events i was sitting down enjoying a meal and two tables down from where I was sitting was a very, very attractive young lady that kept that kept looking at me. And I thought, I really cannot be that good looking. <laughs> <laughs> As it happened, she came across and she said, it's Simon, isn't it? I said, yes, that's right. Uh, she said, I come from the village of Chapman, not too far from where you live. Oh, yes, of course. I said, I know the area very well. She said, Simon, I have been on your guided tours and I quite like them. She said, have you ever thought about applying for a job on the cruise ships as a as a lecturer to do a PowerPoint show on stories? And I said, well, would people like ghostly tales? Um, uh, Louise, that was her name. She said, well, Simon, I think they might do. So she gave me an email address uh, for the firm that operated the cruise uh, cruise ships. And I got back to England and I, I typed in the name and I applied. Within four days, I got a response from the cruise directors, and they said, um, would you like to um, audition in Sussex or Cumbria? Now, Sussex is a county in the deep south of England. Cumbria, of course, is where I used to live. And I said, oh, no, I'll go to Cumbria. So I was given a telephone number, and I telephoned a lady called Maureen, and she said, Simon, please bring your laptop I have a projector and I have a screen and uh, bring all your stories and then I shall audition you. I will give you a sat-nav code for my home. She gave me the sat-nav code and I put it into my car and set off. I found myself driving towards the city of Lancaster, a beautiful city which I knew quite well. And from Lancaster, I found myself driving right up to Cumbria, which, of course, I knew again very well. But I found myself going past very, very familiar roads. I went past my old primary school. I went past my old secondary modern school. And then I went down this long, long, gorgeous country lane, which I knew very well from my childhood, and found to my amazement that the sat-nav told me to turn left. I turned left down the driveway, which I knew very well, and straight back to the house which my father sold in 1971 because the cruise uh, director Maureen had bought that house Whoa. only eight years ago. I stopped outside. I looked up at the familiar, beautiful Victorian building and I knocked on the door. There was Maureen. Right, Simon, uh, we've got five hours of work to cover here. She said, you look a bit jaded. What's the problem? I said, well, Maureen, I know you won't believe this, but I used to live here. <laughs> no, she said. I did. I said, I used to live here. I can show you some pictures of my laptop of my childhood. I showed her the, the photographs of my old primary school and indeed the house, indeed the very room we were sitting in. She was quite shocked. She said, well, Simon, I'll make a cup of tea. She made a cup of tea. She then came back to the sitting room where I was sitting and I told her, about my father's experience of the ghostly dog in the bedroom. As I told the story, the teacup slipped through her fingers and smashed at her feet. She said, Simon, my brother 
lives in the city of London. Every Christmas, he comes up from London to stay with me and my husband. The very, very first night he stayed here, Christmas Eve 2012, he was in bed. The door slowly opened in the early hours of the morning and in came a liver and white Cocker Spaniel. I looked up at the ceiling and said, Dad, thank you. And uh, Maureen was quite sh- as well when I told this story, but I can assure you and all the listeners, as the good Lord is my witness, it is 100% true. It really is true. And uh, as it happens, I do use that story because Maureen, um, uh, the cruise director, she did audition me again five weeks later because I couldn't do it that day. I was just too shocked. The next visit was was really, really happy. And um, she got me some work on the cruise ships, which was quite nice, really. Wonderful. My goodness. So that man, I wonder what the story could be behind that. I mean, the gentleman in Victorian dress had the lead and he was looking for his dog. And the dog just That's keeps quite- coming through the door like that. I wonder what the story is behind that. You know, I, I do believe, uh, Siska, there's certain people can see things. My dad was quite sensitive Mm -hmm. and perhaps Maureen's brother could have been sensitive. I would be a liar to tell you I've seen a ghost because I haven't. Mm -hmm. But I do meet um, in my business as a a tour guide. I do come across quite a few psychics and mediums Mm -hmm. and you can always tell when someone's being very honest and Mm -hmm. very, very truthful. And uh, my dad would not lie about anything. He really wouldn't. Absolutely. And I just, I I always find, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. We often talk on this show about, you know, I I have had experiences in a room with several people and, you know, maybe one or two saw it and the others did not. Or someone will have a lot of experiences in a home and then another family moves in and they have no experiences and then they move out and then the next family moves in and they have experiences. So we often wonder what that is about people who have that, whether it's a sensitivity or if it's a certain energy that um, they're able to click into. Um, You have one there. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, uh, I'm sure you have, the Borley. um, Oh, Borley Rex. Oh my gosh, Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's one family to the next, you know, that Uh, that have those experiences there, you know. Uh, very, very much so. Um, that, that's that's a great story, the Borley Rectory in Sussex, in the county of Sussex. Um, that's got ghostly coaches and things, really. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's certainly a, a fascinating place to visit. Mm-hmm. It really, really is. But um, I personally have not seen anything there. I didn't feel any, any bad vibes. But again, I'm not a medium. I'm not mm-hmm. a psychic. So I can't really tune in. But um, I do have another gripping story for you which is quite similar really um in england of course we have these beautiful beautiful halls and residences they're all what we call grade one listed buildings which means they're protected by law one uh hall i'm regularly invited to is the home of the parker family the parker family have lived at brusom hall since 1507 when the building was first built they, the family just absolutely love collecting items, uh, interesting items, really. And when I first went to the hall and uh, was given a guided tour by Mr. Parker, who was really training me up for the job, really, um, he brought out what looked like part of an old aircraft. And he said, Sam, what's this? I said, well, it looks a bit like, like um, the ribbing of an aircraft. He said, well, you're not too far wrong. It's actually part of of a German Zeppelin, the L-31. I went home and I read about this story and it really was quite gripping. It does have a ghostly encounter at the end of the story, Cisco. But we're going to turn the clock back now to World War I. Now, our German cousins are extremely good at inventing, dare I say it, terror weapons they seem to be always on the ball when it comes to um, military technology Mm -hmm. and they invented a most amazing vessel called the zeppelin which is an airship now the l31 was run by the german naval service and its officer was called hauptmann matte captain hauptmann matte 
and he would fly over London at extreme height and he could bomb London at his will. He was causing millions and millions of pounds of damage. Now, the artillery on the ground hadn't got the technology to actually hit him because he was just too high. Now, the British, a bit like the Germans, are very, very good at trying to solve problems. And they brought out a new aircraft called the SE-5, the SE-5 fighter. And they also realized that if they closed in on the Zeppelin, a normal bullet would just go through it because the helium uh, would almost be a bit pneumatic, if you will. It would stop the it wouldn't really cause any damage. So therefore, the laboratories in England worked out a new bullet called the incendiary, the incendiary round, which is basically a bullet that was on fire. On the 17th of October, 1916, Hauptmann Matte took off from uh, Wilhelmshaven in Germany straight towards London. He had actually written to, of all people, the New York Post and told the New York Post readers, I can bomb London at my will. They can't even touch me. However, this night, the Royal Air Force with this new aircraft were ready for him. 20-year-old Jonathan Tempest took off from Barnet, North London, an aerodrome at North London, and it took him one hour to get to the height of the Zeppelin in pretty freezing cold conditions. He had leather gauntlets on, a leather jacket, a leather helmet, and conditions in the aircraft, which was an open cockpit, must have been exceptionally cold. However, he closed in on the L-31 Zeppelin. He could see the German crew in the gondola beneath it making rather rude two-fingered gestures at him <laughs> he closed in at the uh, at the zeppelin side and when his the crosswires of his machine guns uh, crossed the zeppelin he opened fire sending these incendiary rounds directly at the zeppelin to his delight he saw a golden glow inside the zeppelin and to his horror he saw the zeppelin crashing towards earth belching smoke and flames but to his horror he saw the entire German crew jump to their deaths above what we call Temple Bar in London. They landed uh, in the city of London itself. Uh, of course, they were all killed on the impact. But as the Zeppelin came down in the city of London that night, there was a chap called Thomas Lister Parker. He rushed to the crash site and saw um, buildings on fire where the Zeppelin had come down. But um, with his umbrella... He hooked a piece of the wreckage away and took his coat off and wrapped it in his coat, got on the first train back to the north of England and he and displayed the Zeppelin actually at the hall. However, some unusual things started to happen over the years. German voices were heard downstairs at night time in the hall and uh, parts of the Zeppelin itself were found in different parts of the room downstairs. They couldn't work out what was happening because the building was locked. But they, um, they found that Zeppelin, um, would, Zeppelin wreckage would find itself all over the house as if picked up by an invisible hand. Mm. What I can tell you is in World War I, um, the British were very, very um, chivalrous, really. And the entire German crew were taken to a cemetery um, outside Temple Bar where they were given full military funerals. And um, after World War I, the German families came over to England to uh, put flowers in the graves of these uh, th these German air crews. But uh, it's amazing how technology uh, did in fact stop the, the Zeppelins from ever coming to England ever again. And today in modern warfare, the incendiary round is still used to this very, very day. My goodness. Oh. And just to show again how close we are in in our lives and how they touch each other. We're not as far apart as we think. I live exactly six miles from where the Hindenburg went down. Oh, gosh, yes. In Lakehurst, yeah. New Jersey. Is that not amazing? And I can remember my mom telling me stories of how they heard it then on the radio and went down to see the aftermath of the whole thing. But my goodness, yeah, uh, the very scary uh, they were wonderful technology, and I think they had a lot going for them. But the uh, fact that they were so flammable, 
is just it's it just scares me so much, you know. But yeah, that thing went down pretty quick, and it went up like a, a tinderbox, as they would say. Yes, yeah, it, I've seen the, um, the 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 film footage. It's pretty horrible, isn't it? Really, it pretty is. horrible to watch. Really, yeah. uh, quite quite disturbing. Really. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't imagine being on that and coming down. And of course, you're surrounded by all that gas. And I know there's a lot of controversy about it, how it started and what happened. But, you know, when you're on something like that, and it's going down, you don't care how it started, you just want to get away from it. And it's very hard to get away from because even if they made it to the ground, and they were running it, they're so huge, that fire was falling on them. And I think that was just uh you know, the famous radio thing, Oh, the Humanity. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. 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 Pretty horrible. Man, I tell you what, uh, I know you have another um, engagement to go to. And before uh, I let you go or I get you started on, on something else, I want you to tell the listeners where to find you right now. You do the Top Hat Tours, of course. but And I know you have your YouTube channel and all of that is going to be in our description uh, below this video so they can connect in and get right to you. You have Ghostly Tales of the Unexpected, the book. What else do you have going on, Simon, and where can we find you? Uh, right. Well, uh, you've got my website, which is uh, www.tophattours.co.uk. Um, also, YouTube, I've got Ghostly Tales from the Grave. Mm -hmm. I do have uh, a book out called um, Ghostly Tales of the Unexpected. And I'm working on a second book right now, Cisco, because I've got so much time in my hands. Oh, it's you. nice. <laughs> it's nice to actually concentrate on this on the second book, which I am doing. But I've just taken part in a um, a television pilot called haunted rooms mm. and um that's just gone to the commission as, as we as we speak actually but the whole idea is to choose a very very historical building in england wales scotland or ireland and um of course i would look at the history of these lovely buildings and then bring in mediums uh, different mediums for each episode and see what they can pick up from each haunted room and um we did the pilot show and i was very very impressed with a lady called maddie mitch and she came from uh, the beautiful isle of man which is in between england and uh way and uh, northern ireland and uh, she picked up everything quite beautifully so it's a bit like a game show if you will uh, each um medium is given points for their accuracy yeah. of describing what they picked up it's a great idea and uh, i'm really hoping that that will take off of course it's all up to the commissioners right. whether um whether they like it or not then they'll commission it and um, the producer jason seemed to be quite impressed with the work that i put into the um the actual uh, stories behind each building really that's amazing what a great idea for a show now each medium it's almost like a game show you said i, I hesitate so. to ask you what the prize would be do they get their very own ghost if they win <laughs> uh, uh, what they were hoping to do actually cisco is um uh, each winner would go to um to like a, a super round where nice. um, we'd have like um six mediums and uh, probably a, a good one and a half hour show so wow. that they'd all get a good a good 10 minutes each to work out what they what they could pick up really I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful, Simon, here in the States. I know it's different, you know, where you are. I don't know what your shows are like there, but I have a lot of friends tell me that the ones in America are just, oh, because, you know, there's so much. Um, I think when they started it, Simon, they took out all of the feeling and the heart kind of like and wanted to just go science and tech. Now we're starting yeah. to get back to science and tech plus the feeling plus the people with sensitivities like mediums and psychics and and um, people with abilities and I think it's wonderful it's all coming back together now because truly uh, like Hans Holzler said you know uh, ghosts you know I'm not afraid of ghosts they're just people who need in need of help and if we're going to help them as well as find out about them I think it's great that we're putting the heart back in it you know I think it's wonderful what you're doing well, it was a very, very enjoyable slot, that really. But what was quite nice is that the, when these three mediums arrived at this beautiful building where we did the pilots, they didn't know where they were going to. Mm -hmm. Their mobile phones were taken off them. And they were all met at the railway station by, um, by, by taxi and then brought to the venue. And um, each one was then taken to um, the same room and then filmed as to what they could pick up. I would then look at the film and say, well, 
yes, she's quite right about the Victorians being there. She's quite right about a murder that took place there. And um, some people do have skills. They really, really do. And uh, I, I was very impressed. Uh, my wife's my biggest critic, and she saw the, she saw the pilot. And she said, Simon, that, that's probably the best work you've ever done, really, because it was really genuine. It was really true. Well, you just have to come back on it when it gets, because we're going to just stay positive and it's going to be taken by the commission and it's going to be on and it's going to be a hit. And we'd love to have you back to tell us more about it, my love. Thank you, Cisco. I'm so glad you stopped in today and please take care. Give our best to your wife and everybody, you know, in your care. Uh, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this globally, not just as separate nations, but we'll get through this. And as, as you guys always say, keep calm and drink tea. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, there's plenty of tea around here. Plenty of tea. Yes. Thank you so, so much, Simon. I know you have to go and I'm just so glad you got to stop in uh, for a uh, time with us today. You be, you be Thank well. You, Cisco. Thank you, Cisco. Great pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you. Absolutely. Love. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much to Simon Entwistle for coming on today. He's such a busy man these days. It's it's amazing. Um, he went from having everything canceled because, of course, the, the, um, the lockdown and the quarantines. And now he's very busy uh, working on a microphone. And it, it's absolutely amazing uh, if you think about it, what you can do when you reach out. So we're very glad he had time to stop in today. However, um, I was thinking, uh, talking to Simon, um, he made me think of the Borley Rectory. And I know in my first episode, um, it's called Truly Ghostly. Uh, I did speak about the Borley Rectory. And I believe I brought that story in to talk a little bit about not only residual hauntings, um, that Borley Rectory had so much going on. I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. I know uh, some of you know an awful lot about it, and some maybe never heard of it before. So I wanted to tell you, basically, it's, um, it's reputed to be the most haunted house in the UK. Now, that's really saying something, because if you think about the history um, there's so many uh, hauntings going on on the grounds and in castles that are still standing to today, um, haunted pubs and all kinds of uh, just regular homes that are still, you have to think about it, history when you go into the UK and, and uh, you know, Britain and you say, you know, well, I have lived in a horse, historic house. Well, they could be saying it's been standing since the 1500s or the 1300s. It's amazing. We're here in America. We look back and we think, oh gosh, I've got a 150 year old house or maybe a 200 year old house. It's really saying something. So there is, it seems like a difference. And we often talk about, well, the land was still here and we have an awful lot of, um, battlefield and you know um, Native American massacres you know that that's happened and now we've got these big highways going across and the history is still here it's just that the buildings aren't as old as they are of course in the UK so um, the rectory was built by the Reverend Henry D. E. Bull in 1863 now that's the rectory all right but it says that the history goes way back to 1362 when Benedictine monks built a monastery on the site, which would later hold the rectory. And legend told of a nun from the Burr's Coven, Co Con Convent, excuse me, seven miles southeast of the Borley, and she fell in love with a monk from the monastery. They had decided to elope to be together. But the elders discovered their plans, and a friend of a monk was to drive the carriage to help them escape. On the faithful night, they were captured by the elders. The coachman was beheaded, the monk hanged, and the nun was bricked up alive in the walls of the vaults beneath the rectory. Their ghosts have haunted the site forever, ever since. Now, I've got a lot to say about that one, but I don't understand <laughs> how people you know, to, to be that cruel, uh, to people and, you know, be standing there and saying that, you know, you're doing the right thing, um, you know, as a religion and that, that always bothers me. But anyway, um, it seems like 
literally overkill to me, but there you go. Um, since then, they've always had uh, something going on in the rectory. The nun is seen walking through the gardens toward where the lake is. Monks are seen walking through the halls. A um, Also, the uh, phantom coach has been seen going down the hallway and also coming through the gates. Um, that one always got me too, because you think, well, coming down the hallway, well, did that used to be a road or is this also, you know, is it a residual or is it, um, reoccurrence of the night because there was so much emotion? Um, obviously the nun is still wandering and, and, you know, looking for forgiveness or looking for her, her, her loved one, um, the man, the monk that she loved. I don't know, but, uh, sad to me to seem that they couldn't have gotten together. Let's hope they have since then. But uh, every family that moved in there, uh, obviously into the rectory, uh, would have a different experience from things moving to, you know, things breaking and flying around, of course, the coach and seeing different things. Um, and eventually, Harry Price um, bought it and went in to take. He was what... He, a lot of people say the first ghost hunter, the first one that used the name ghost hunter. Um, and that was in, let's see, I believe in the 30s, 1930s. I could be wrong on that. But uh, anyway, he did an awful lot of studies in there. And it, it was quite an amazing thing. If you ever get a chance, look it up. And... Um, Basically, Harry Price said it was the most extraordinary and best documented case of haunting in, in the annals of the of uh, physical research by Harry Price. And he took a lot of students in there from the college and had them. There's all kinds of things on automatic writing. They did all kinds of um, what he considered experiments in there. Um, look into that and see what you think. Because uh, the Borley Rectory, you know, the pictures are amazing, um, the personal accounts are amazing, and it's just always made me so sad because I just don't understand why um, they couldn't just let them go off and be together. I mean, what were they hurting? You know what I mean? For Pete's sake. You know, so there's that. I don't think she deserved to be walled up, bricked up into a wall to die um, like that. You know, uh, it's just crazy. And, you know, quite honestly, if somebody did that to me, you're darn right. I'm coming back and haunt you too. But you, she let them off a little easy because I'd be a little bit more, uh, <laughs> I think I'd be a little more physical. <laughs> you had a lot of years to learn, right? So there's always such a sad story um, behind um, usually a haunting. Um, I wonder so much about the one Simon told us with the, the little dog and the man that was looking for the dog and had the lead in his hand and the dog was coming into the room and opened the door time and time again. Um, that's an amazing thing, you know, that over all those years, two people saw it that Simon got to meet. What an interesting thing. You almost wonder if there wasn't a spirit hand in there just to let him know that that was a true story his dad told him. Quite amazing. It's always wonderful when Simon stops in. Uh, don't forget to look him up on the sites that he mentioned. Also, everything is going to be in the show notes. Uh, look in there. Um, he's also doing a radio show right now. I believe it's live. I don't think it's recorded, but you can check in on that. on the It's the, on BBC Radio, and there's a link you can go to, and you can listen to it live when he's on because he's always telling fantastic stories. So I'll try to get that link for you, too, and see what I can do. So I'd like to um, thank everybody. Also, don't forget about the book. You got a little time on your hands or you know somebody else that does uh, my book uh, and Steve Stockton's book. It's called We Are All Children in the Wilderness of the Afterlife, A Guided Tour Through a Haunted Life. And there's lots of different ghost stories in there and lots of different um, thoughts on the different ghost stories that happened. There's um, what I consider possibly angels or spirit guides, um, little miracles that you know, happened to me that I can't explain. Um, some quite frightening things that happened to that, um, 
I can't really explain. I've got some ideas about it, but you might have some ideas too. So, and some wonderful um, follow-ups from Steve Stockton, who's a f- fantastic storyteller. And of course, he's got his books on Amazon too, uh, Strange Things in the Woods and More Strange Things and My Strange Life. So look those up. He's a fantastic uh, storyteller. He's also got a great YouTube channel, uh, 13 Past Midnight, and check that out. And also, we are both on something new. It's called KPNL Radio. And you can find that on their website. You can also find it via Facebook. You can come into the Discord chat and uh, talk while um, wonderful Lady Anne, who runs the radio station, she puts together some theme nights. There is some fantastic music on there. I think it's going to just blow your mind how wonderful these artists are. And um, she does some fun things on Sunday. It's like mysteries and old radio shows that are mystery and, you know, a little ghostly. Um, Very cool. And uh, look for the theme shows. She just did a fantastic one on werewolves and all the different podcasts that were on there. She put them together as a theme. We've got Mysterious uh, Circumstances with uh, Justin Rimmel. We've got Caravan of Lore with, of course, Lady Anne. We've got uh, Steve's 13 Past Midnight. I believe that uh, Brian Bowden, Nobo uh, no Boomi is on there now. Um, myself, Journey Through the Gate. We've got, uh, oh, if I forgot somebody, please let me know. But uh, there's a wonderful array of podcasts on this station. So, And it's just fun to listen to, even just have on in the background and listen to the wonderful music and old commercials and things. It's just fun. She's doing a very great job. So hello, Anne. I love you. And everybody out there in the uh, KPNL Discord, hi, Jose and Jake and and Steve and Lenny and everybody that's in there. So uh, come on in and see what you think. Um, We're in there now, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. It's just a wonderful piece of work she's put together, and very hard she's worked on it, and it shows. It's a a class act. It's a class act. You can also find my book on there. She's got uh, a place where she's got everybody's books together and um, other books that... uh, a recommended reading that that she's done and uh, some of the other listeners have done. And she's made it very easy. You just touch the book and it takes you right to Amazon or wherever they're sold. And uh, it's changing every day. And and, uh, she's adding more wonderful things every day. So thank you, Lady Anne, for letting me be a part of that. And thank you, listeners, for letting me be a part of your evening tonight. Um, Thank you, Simon. And, um, you know, I'm hoping... That um, by the time this episode comes out, it finds us all well and um, a little closer to the ones we love. I am hoping that um, we all get through this. It Where I am in New Jersey, it is um, quite rapidly uh, taking a turn for the worst. I don't even think it's peaked yet, and I've actually been in lockdown now probably about 10, 11 days Um and I, I know some people personally who have, uh, and their families who have suffered through this and the loss of life is real. And I want you to be careful. I want you to take it seriously. I want you to do everything you can think of to protect yourself, um, from this, um, because you can't, you can't go back and wish you had, you know, maybe used rubber gloves or, not touch that thing or you didn't go out and do a social event um, and then find out a couple of weeks later that you probably shouldn't have done it. Um, Let's just hunker down and stay in our bunkers and try to do whatever we can with our days to make it a little bit better for somebody else. Um, You know, if, if you wanted to learn how to paint or you wanted to learn how to crochet or you wanted to build that fort in the backyard with your kids or whatever it may be, do it, do it with everything you've got in your whole heart and look back at this and smile and know you did something good with your time. And, uh, listen guys, it's the first time that we get to, uh, save the world by sitting on our butts and staying inside. Let's not screw it up. Okay. I love you all. And in the meantime, keep your feet 
under those covers. Keep your closet doors shut, because there are things that go bump in the night. Good night, everybody. Stay safe out there.